comes to the point okay, where so it's like you're like now. I need to need to teach more frequently so I can remember <laughs> what these things are. Okay, good morning. Um, can someone shut their door, please, so that we're not to get heard outside? Okay, this morning we are going to look at money, um, and more specifically the connection between the way that governments get their money and the way that they govern. This is an issue that might come as something of a surprise to some of you, um, because it raises questions that people don't always think about automatically. I'm going to do it by looking at the same issue in two distinct ways in two different halves. So in a sense, we're looking at two sides of the same coin. And the first one is essentially about taxes, and the second one is essentially about natural resources and natural resource extraction. So, just I want to start a slightly um, abstractly and just think about the broader context. So, you know, we have a government in place, it's nicely democratically elected, um, constitutionally, follows the law, etc., etc. Um, does that mean that the government is always going to do what the electorate means and wants and no one else? Well, the answer is no. I mean, the electorates are just one of many influences on governments, and sometimes they're actually quite a small influence on governments. Many other organized actors are actually much more influential. And in a sense, you could, I'm going to give you a list of these other organized actors. But one way, practical way of saying, is this country a democracy? Uh, even if it has, imagine it has the formal institutions of democracy and elections. Is it, if it's really a democracy, these other actors here don't have very much influence on government. But they'll always have some. And um, no surprise, and many governments <coughs> in the world, including in the global south, have to pay a lot of attention to these other kinds of actors. And here they are listed, pretty obvious. Uh, the first one is the military that's very important in many countries, and if not kept happy, um, might organize a coup or some other change of government. Trade unions, less important in most countries these days, but potentially important, particularly because they have the potential to strike and cause economic disruption, etc. So they, they might not be numerous, but they are often occupy strategic positions. Religious organizations can be very important, principally because they provide government with some kind of legit legitimacy. So classically, in the Catholic areas of Europe, uh, Portugal, France, uh, well, not, no, not France, Spain, Italy, etc., much of Latin America, the Catholic Church has, has been quite an important actor, and governments always wanted to keep the Catholic Church on the same side. <clears throat> Investors are also important, because if, in, uh, whether they're foreign or domestic, because if they decide that they don't like the government or the government's economic policy and they decide not to invest very much and then the economy doesn't do very well, well, governments on average are not going to be very effective or very successful. So they want to keep investors happy. Uh, political funders, increasingly important globally because as the world has more and more elections and elections get more and more expensive, finding someone who will actually fund elections becomes very big. And I suppose the United States is the classic case where political funders have 
probably become the most important uh, external influence on government. Um, so a few criminal thugs governments often need. Um, you need to, in some contexts, you need the criminal underworld at least to be on your side or not against you. Because you need them you know, to help intimidate the opposition and make sure they're not intimidating your people. So you want to keep them happy. Uh, aid donors are always good um, if they will give you free money. Um, and we'll come back to aid donors later. And the eighth one on the list is taxpayers, because taxpayers pay taxes. And taxes are a very important source of government revenue. And so if taxpayers are not very willing to pay, then you have an issue. Now, I'm going to put a kind of proposition here that of that list of eight, uh, you know, uh, interest groups, if you want, in addition to electors, nearly all of them tend to have what you might call a negative influence from a democracy point of view. We'd rather they didn't have influence on government, but they do. But there is an argument, and that's what we're going to explore in the first half of this morning, that taxpayers are an exception and that they can actually have quite a positive influence on government. So I'm picking them out as the, the special case of you know, a very important uh, additional interest group. So another sort of conceptual background here, where do governments get their money from? Well, the general answer is from an incredible diversity of sources. But um, this is a list here which is kind of historical, starting from earlier stages and then moving towards the contemporary world. So historically, plunder, tribute, slavery, you know, pure violence, if you want, has been a very important source of income for governments or what I'm calling political authorities. Um, another important source of income at various points, which is less important in the world now, but still significant, is governments finding a key commodity that consumers really want and are prepared to pay a lot of money for, and then slapping a monopoly on the production and processing and sale of that and making a lot of money. So um, goods like salt, tobacco, alcohol have been important sources of income for some governments at some points in time. Similarly, uh, many governments at different points in time have funded themselves in large part through monopoly control of a major income earning asset. Land, industry, railways, post offices, ports, um, big canals like the Suez or Panama Canal, military bases that you lease to uh, foreign powers, etc. And centrally planned or communist e economies were fundamentally based on that. that The state had a monopoly of industry in particular and funded itself through the profits of that industry. Slightly similarly, point four, monopoly control of export of major agricultural commodities, cocoa, cotton, coffee, sugar. Um, as I mentioned, you've probably forgotten when I lectured you in the first week, there was a point, especially in Africa, in the middle of the last century, and especially just after independence, where a lot of African governments tried to fund themselves in that way. They basically took control of the uh, cotton export industry, paid farmers less than uh, farmers would have got if there'd been a free market, uh, controlled the export, and you know, took the surplus for themselves. It doesn't work terribly well for terribly long because farmers tend to, after a while, decide that they really don't want to produce much cotton because they're not making much out of it. So those four are mostly historical sources of government income. You don't find very much of any of those things in the contemporary world. And in the contemporary world, governments mainly fund themselves by numbers five, six, and seven. So these are the ones we're going to look at today. First is the control of the extraction and export of oil, gas, and a very wide range of minerals. And that we're going to deal with in the second half, 
Um, number six is broad, what I'm calling broad general taxation. And that means taxation that's fairly widely distributed among all citizens that can take many forms, sales tax, um, taxes on imports, taxes on income, taxes on property, etc. And the seventh one is foreign aid. Okay, still slightly at the level of concepts, uh, just to give you a, a bit of background here. There is the notion of a tax state and a fiscal state. And what a tax state is, is a state that basically funds itself through broad general taxes. And a fiscal state, in this kind of classical literature, is a state that funds itself so well through broad general taxes, has such a good tax system, and can fund it so reliably, that it can go to private commercial markets and borrow a lot of money on the strength of the fact that we have a really good tax system, you can be sure we're going to pay you back. And there is an argument from some fairly distinguished economists here that a very important trend in Europe in the last couple of centuries, uh, they were writing 100 years ago, was the development of tax states and then the development of fiscal states. And you know, just as a kind of uh, footnote on this, you know, the world's first and most effective fiscal state was Britain. Um, from arguably early, mid-1700s, uh, the British government had a very good tax system. They could then borrow a lot of money privately. Um, and so they could, they could uh, actually hire very large militaries of various kinds. And um, here we are. The rest is history. Imperialism. That's what the basis of British imperialism was a very effective fiscal state. Question. In terms of fiscal states, they end up borrowing from private entities. Doesn't that open them up to the influence of those private entities, and doesn't that negatively impact democracy as a whole? Um, well, that's a fairly okay. I, want, I mean, let's come back to that later. Um, but if you believe in markets and you believe markets work well, I mean, why should private entities who are lending to governments care what the government does, provided they get their, you know, their money repaid and they get their interest repaid? So at least in principle, um, this is not a political relationship, it's a commercial market relationship. Now, it's not always exactly like that, but I think most of the time it actually is like that. OK, so what is it about taxes and governance that's really important? And I'm calling this the wishful story. This is a view that I can't say is very widespread, but it's quite common, and it's become quite common in development studies in the last 10, 20 years. And specific quotation from a specific book here. The assertion is that taxes somehow establish a direct, accountable relationship between government and citizens. Important quote, when people pay taxes, they expect their governments to deliver. And then they hold government institutions to account. So that's the core argument here. People pay taxes. They have expectations they're going to get something in return. <coughs> and they make sure that they you know, through political action that they do get something in return. So that is the key argument, and um, it sounds great. Uh, it's wonderful, because if that's true, you could well argue that the weaknesses of democratic electoral institutions could be bolstered and supported by the tax relationship. So it would be broadly supportive of the, of the democratic electoral relationship. The question is, is it true? Well, again, I'm, I'm going to the, the big question of, is it true? 
But again, I think it's useful to give a historical context because one of the reasons that this particular narrative has become popular is again actually English or British history. Because if you go back even further in British history, if you find a sequence of historical events that seem to validate this idea that paying taxes is a very important underpinning of political representation and even democracy. And the essence of the story is that if we go back to the 1620s to 1650s, there was a very long struggle in, at that point, England and Wales between the king and the majority in Parliament. And Parliament represented the wealthy and it also represented a lot of wealthy international traders based in London and Bristol. And the conflict, to a large degree, centered around the question of who had the power to raise taxes, which had been previously a little bit constitutionally ambiguous. And Parliament became quite assertive and said, we, Parliament, are the only people authorized to collect taxes. You, King, cannot mandate any taxes on uh, your own behalf. And the king said, no, no, I, king, can raise whatever taxes I want. Anyway, this eventually led to a civil war, and the king lost the civil war. He lost his head at the same time. Um, partly, this was stimulated by the fact that there was an invasion from Scotland, and then money was desperately needed to uh, fend off the Scots, so the king had to call Parliament and you know, please support more taxes. No, no, we won't. So um, then there was a period of a republic, and then 1660, the king's son came back. And that conflict kind of continued on a much lower level way between the next king and the king after him. And then we had what was called the Glorious Revolution that was basically an invasion from Holland um, of uh, the ruler of Holland and his wife, who happened to be the king's daughter. So it wasn't entirely a foreign invasion. Um, and there was a political settlement after that that established very clearly that in future, Parliament was the sole authority in both raising taxes and authorizing public spending of any kind. And the king had no influence whatsoever over that. And so in England, we then had a not a democratically representative parliament, but a representative parliament that lasted for a very long time. And um, as I said earlier, Britain became a fiscal state and then a great imperial power, etc. So this looks like a great story because it seems to illustrate exactly in history the kind of process that I've been talking about. Whether it does is a bit more disputable, um, partly because there are some other features of the English case you know, the story I've told you is not the whole story. There were other things going on at the same time. Um, or partly that this conflict between King and Parliament started, but it became increasingly also a religious conflict between broadly Protestants on the side of Parliament and broadly Catholics on the side of the King. So it had a very important religious dimension. And it's also important to bear in mind that Parliament as I said earlier, represented a lot of wealthy traders in London who were not only traders, but they were also effectively pirates. Um, you know, they were sending ships all over the world to you know, get money from uh, Spain, Spanish gold, etc. Um, and they had a great interest in having a state that would raise enough money to create a militarized navy that would support their piracy overseas. So, you know, slightly more complicated theory. But, um, point two here, there is a concept of what's called resource dependence theory, which is kind of important to what we're saying here. This is not a theory in a strong sense. But resource dependence theory, which has been around in, in the field of organization studies for decades, basically says that the way an organization is managed and structured, et cetera, is going to depend on where it gets its key resources from. 
And we're not going to go into that, but the last slide does give a little exercise on that that you or we could go into later. So what I'm talking about, the idea that tax, government source of income, and specifically taxes, then affect how it governs, is a part, in an intellectual sense, of a broader set of ideas about resource dependence. Another concept, which I think is quite useful here, is different types of sources of government income and the notion that they're relatively conditional or unconditional, or in some other phrases, earned versus unearned. Now, this is a bit of a woolly abstract concept. I don't worry about it too much, but the broad idea is that Unconditional income is income that somehow the government can get hold of fairly easily. And once it got it, you know, it entirely controls it and it doesn't have to do anything else to get that income. So plunder, for example, you go and raid a neighboring state and you know take all the gold and riches and slaves and all that. I mean, that is pretty unconditional income because once you've got it, you've got it, it's yours. Um, Oil revenue, and we'll come to later, is actually fairly unconditional income for most governments in the world because they basically say, well, there's oil under the ground. Um, that belongs to the state. Whether we extract that through a state corporation or whether it's a private company that the government controls, you know, broadly, it's mine and you can't do much about it. So that's fairly unconditional income. Broad general taxation is obviously relatively conditional because you basically depend on taxpayers to keep paying every year. So even if you do well this year, it doesn't tell you you'll do well next year. So you have to kind of struggle. And what, whether aid is conditional or unconditional, we will come to a little bit later. So I want to look a little bit more about the taxpayer side of all this. If we just take this broad argument that uh, government dependence on taxpayers is going to lead to um, good things. What are we assuming about taxpayers? Well, the first thing is, in most countries and in most contexts, taxpayers can really flatly refuse to pay taxes. At least the majority can't. They can't say, I'm not going to pay my taxes, because you'll end up dead or in jail or something like that. But they can. Well, what in the first place, when they pay taxes, a few taxpayers ever sort of pay, oh, say, oh, lovely, I'm delighted to contribute to the government. Here, how much do you want? No, no, they're never happy to pay taxes. The most you get from taxpayers is what's called grudging or quasi-voluntary compliance. You know, well, okay, I have to pay my taxes. Here you are, then here's the money. Um, but taxpayers do actually have a lot of power, and more power than that might seem because taxpayers can basically drag their feet and make tax uh, paying, tax collection quite difficult. And you can drag your feet in all kinds of ways depending on which taxes you're paying. But you know the classic way of dragging your feet is just to delay paying your taxes um, until someone actually comes knocking at your door with a gun in their hand and says you've got to pay. But you can drag your feet in all kinds of other ways. You can you know, delay giving the information the government agencies want to collect the taxes. Now, if you get significant feet dragging by uh, taxpayers, that actually becomes a major problem for government. Because government basically then has to authorize its taxpayers to use threat and violence. And you know, don't worry too much about the formal procedures. Just you know, get a hold of these guys and make sure they pay taxes. And once you do that, as a government, you've to some extent lost control of your tax system. Because if you authorize that kind of threat and violence, it's very difficult for you to stop the people collecting taxes, then uh, using violence, but putting a lot of money in their own pockets. They're not, they're not following standard procedures. It's very hard to uh, you know, track what they've done. It's hard to investigate corruption, prove corruption. So from the point of view of a government, you really don't want to get in a position of uh, a lot of foot dragging and therefore a lot of violence. So it is quite important for governments to get a good degree of quasi-voluntary compliance. People used to paying taxes, 
and paying and not delaying too much so that your problem taxpayers are a kind of small minority, not the great majority of people. And if you're in that happy situation, um, you feel much more relaxed. Uh, you can actually predict from one year to the next how much money you've got to some degree because you know how much you collected this year. Well, next year, depending on economic conditions and harvest, you can say we've got so much. Um, and it's quite useful for all kinds of public finance reasons to actually have some sense of what you're going to have next year and not wait till that year and say, well, how, how much did we collect? What can we spend on? So you're in a much better position with the government if you have predictability. And as I said earlier, if you are in that happy position where you have such a good tax system that you can borrow money from uh, commercially, internationally, um, you need to, to get in that position, you need a good degree of predictability about the tax system. Because no wise person, uh, lender in international markets who has a lot of, is going to lend a lot of money to a government that doesn't look as if it can you know, reliably know its income next year and therefore whether it's going to repay. I mean, you might borrow the money, but you're going to have to pay a high rate of interest. So uh, reliable, predictable, sort of semi-voluntary taxpayers are a very important part of a well-functioning fiscal system. And that means that taxpayers potentially have bargaining power in relation to government. Because taxpayers could, and taxpayers individually can't do much unless they're super big. But in principle, taxpayers collectively can then go to government and say, well, OK, um, if you want taxes next year or so and so, uh, you know, we'll agree you know, income tax will be this and imports will be that. No that, what are we going to get in return? Now, you don't often literally see that kind of discussion. But in fact, the British history of the 17th century that I told you about came quite close to that because Parliament represented you know, the class interests of wealthy landowners and wealthy traders. In a sense, Parliament was, <laughs> was taxpayers collectively. So there was almost this, you know, almost direct face-to-face -face explicit bargaining about taxes. But it can happen in the same way through democratic systems. You know, there can be issues in elections of how much taxes we're going to pay for what. So taxpayers have a lot of possibility of bargaining with government. And there are good reasons why both sides should want to reach a deal about taxes. Because, as I said earlier, government benefits enormously from the predictability of knowing that there's a tax system that taxpayers are mostly going to comply with and so they're going to get the money next year. But taxpayers also, and especially business taxpayers and larger taxpayers, benefit enormously from knowing what the tax rate on the, you know, the tax system is going to be next year. Um, because it gives predictability. And as people are always saying, but can never say often enough, Business, the private sector, values predictability of, about government very, very highly. It's very important to the private sector that they know broadly what government's going to do, whether it's taxes or anything else, um, because that allows them to make investment in business plans for the future. So there is a real potential for deals, or a deal, between taxpayers collectively and governments collectively. Um, now we're going to go into a little more detail about how taxes might matter. Um, this is a table that comes from one of your primary readings from some guy at IDS. Um, I can't remember what. Um, okay, and I'm going to make a kind of confession here. I'm not sure I fully believe this. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this is a representation of the most optimistic representation. And it's true that the source that has been very widely quoted um, states this as kind of fact, what happens in the world. If you look through the, that original source, if you look for evidence of this, you won't find very much. Um, and I'm going to come back later to what the evidence is. 
So put this as a set of optimistic hypotheses with some basis in fact, and I'll come back to that later, not as fact about the world. I mean, as a footnote on this, um, people who write um, term papers or final exams and then quote this and, you know, oh, Professor McNaw says, says you know, therefore taxes are very important. They're not very popular with me or other graders, you know, because it means that you read the paper, but you didn't bother to go back. You either weren't at the lecture or you didn't go back to listen to the recording and find out that these are not true propositions, you know, validated propositions about the world. They are just arguments. Uh, but let's go through the arguments, which are fairly abstract. So, what happens if a government is dependent on broad general taxation, has no other significant sources of revenue at all? Um, well, the first thing, and I've sort of labeled this responsiveness, if the government has no other significant sources of revenue, imagine I'm, I'm the government and you're the taxpayers. What is my interest in you? And therefore, hmm? I would be more than happy, prosperous. I want you to be happy. I also want you to be prosperous. Um, so that means that I have an interest in doing the kind of things that make you prosper. You know, in whether it's building roads or ports or broadband systems or anything else. I think there is very strong reasons to think that dependence just on taxes actually works quite well in terms of motivating states. If you want to, you can say promote economic development if you want. Now, it's very hard to find direct evidence for that, but we'll find plenty of contrary evidence in the second half when we come to the opposite when the state is not dependent on broad general taxes. So first, um, I have a general interest in your prosper happiness and prosperity. Secondly, and this is under capacity, arguably, and it's not clear that it's actually true, but certainly in historical cases, and the English-British case in particular, it's been argued that a good tax system is a kind of precursor of a good public service more broadly. And the, the argument for that, I think, is fairly clear. Um, if you are going to run an effective tax system, you have to find very good ways of controlling and monitoring your tax collecting staff, because the normal motivation of tax collecting staff is to put a lot in their pocket. So if you find ways of recruiting good, you know, good people, monitoring what they do, punishing infractions, and keeping the system functioning well, um, then it is argued that that creates, it's like that's the nucleus of uh, you know, a good public administration more broadly, because you learn lessons from that. Whether that's broadly true, I don't know. Um, there is quite a lot of evidence that in the British case that was true. It may not be that true these days. So there are some positive effects around responsiveness that are actually nothing to do with any direct political interaction between you, the taxpayers, and me, the state. This is just saying, if I'm depending on your taxes, I'm going to be motivated to do some things that are in my interest and they happen to be in your interest. Um, but this is not the result of any pressure from you. And those are not the core arguments that most people put forward when they say taxes are a good thing. If we go back to uh, the quotation, okay. Most people, when they talk about the tax, uh, the effect of taxes on governance, think that it's something to do with people and popular action um, and people responding to the fact that they have to pay taxes. So, so far in what I've said here, I've said nothing about that. Um, and that comes in the lower part of, the, of this table here. So forget what we said about responsiveness. So then the argument is essentially that paying taxes engages people politically, that they are likely to uh, you know, they might 
rub along and they might have terrible roads and you know very poor justice systems etc and people might accept that and they might not be too worried about it but then when you actually ask them to pay some taxes it's like hey you know you said it's kind of wake up call if you want psychologically you're asking me to pay money but what am i getting in return so the broad argument starts from the idea that paying taxes potentially mobilizes people politically and then they start chatting and well, why are those bastards asking us to pay taxes? What are we getting in return? Can't we do something about this? So you then get um, in the wishful form of the argument, you then begin to get debate among citizens. You say, well, we need something from government. And then in the wishful form of the argument, you get some engagement with government and people start saying, you know, either in return for your votes or your taxes or something else, you know, what are you going to give us in return? So the argument is that paying taxes really stimulates people to organize, engage with government uh, about what government is going to do from them, for them. And so in the most strongest case, which is very much based on the English historical case, you get effects what I call C1, C2, and three C4. Um, once government and citizens start to engage, they make broad agreements about the tax system that makes ta the tax system more, more accountable, sorry, more acceptable and predictable with the results that I mentioned earlier. And the taxation process becomes more efficient because you can, to some extent, squeeze out corruption and mis uh, misuse of money by tax collectors. Secondly, it's argued you actually get more public policy discussion and with better results, because citizens are coming out and saying, well, if you're going to collect so much revenue on that, what are you going to spend it on? Um, you know, is this a good use of money, etc." So it's argued you'll get better debate. It's argued you tend to get then more scrutiny of how public money is spent, because you, the taxpayers, say, look, this is our money. Even when we've given it to you, we want to know what you're doing with it. And therefore, if we want accountant generals and all those kind of people to um, take account of what's been done and report to Parliament. And then it's argued that you ultimately get the legislature strengthened relative to the executive. So it's, it's all good stuff, if it works. Um, here's some questions about the extent to which it's going to work, especially in low-income countries today. Um, well, the first thing is that we've thrown many good things into the pot here, but we're not quite clear which good things we're talking about. So when you, the taxpayers, start to negotiate with me, what are you going to negotiate about? Well, are you going to get, negotiate about the level of taxes? Are you going to negotiate about principles for changing or setting taxes in future? Are you going to negotiate about the level and type of public spending? Are you going to negotiate about how far the details of public spending are contro controlled through the legislature? Um, are you going to then, but even more, negotiate about who is actually represented in the legislature? Are you going to you know, push for wider, uh, a wider electorate on the grounds that uh, people pay taxes and they should be represented? I mean, these are all possible parts of the story, but um, when many academics tell the story, they tell some bits or they choose some bits and they don't choose other bits. So many things could happen. Um, secondly, uh, do taxpayers actually form a coherent group with a strong common interest? Are you guys, as taxpayers, all actually going to get together and negotiate with me? Why not? When you have a divergent position, you have divergent interests. That's just the normal way of life. Um, okay, <laughs> that suggests you're never going to get common collective action. Um, can you even, on, even on, say, uh, like, for example, you just take the, the, the recent riots in America that happened on the, the beginning of last week. You had parts of America rioting, parts of America that were speaking. So sure. Essentially, depending on your background, your upbringing, your environment, you're not going to have 
I mean, I would put it slightly differently. I mean, I think sometimes yes and sometimes no. It's not you're never going to get common collective action. And as I said earlier, you know, the British historical case, you did, because Parliament effectively represented most big taxpayers. So, I mean, you got, you did get class action there, uh, representing most big taxpayers. And you'll find that in some, uh, it's not unusual in uh, countries with democracy where a lot of people pay taxes through personal income tax, that issues about um, levels of income tax, for example, get on the agenda in politics. And while not everyone might be on the same side, sometimes there are fairly kind of common views. But, I mean, you're right in the sense that we shouldn't assume that because we call people taxpayers, that therefore they all, you know, that that is the most important thing they have in common, because they have plenty of other things that might divide them. People might politically organize around being taxpayers, but they can organize also around being a whole lot of other things. And they, they're from different regions, um, they're from different occupations. Uh, they might have a different relationship to government spending. Some people might be very keen and benefit from government spending, others don't. So we don't assume that taxpayers have a political identity as taxpayers in their heads just because they're taxpayers. And the extent to which this is uh, taxpayers do act collectively depends in part, obviously, on how government's revenue from taxes is distributed. Um, there is, I won't go into detail, let me just give you one sort of broad general point. If you compare in the world to today, leave aside countries that are rich in oil and gas and minerals, but if you look at other countries, compare rich and poor countries. On the whole, in richer countries, government sources of income are quite widely distributed in the sense that they depend quite heavily on people like me to pay personal income tax and value-added tax on the things I buy. So the general rich countries, the tax burden is fairly widely distributed over a lot of you know, fairly ordinary you know, middle class, lower middle class, and wealthier people. Poorer countries, on average, government revenue is more concentrated on companies, especially larger companies. Um, for, uh, I mean, there are a whole range of reasons for that difference that I'm not going to go into now. But it is important for this argument, because if taxpayers are going to be organized and represented in many lower income countries, there's a fair chance that the taxpayers who are actually concerned enough to mobilize about this are going to be business. They're not going to be, you know, and larger business, they're not going to be the broader mass of the population. So the idea then that the representation of taxpayers somehow bolsters and supports democracy becomes, you know, it's questionable. I wouldn't say it never happens, but it becomes questionable. And point four is related to that, because the simple model that I presented to you earlier about the relationship between government and taxpayers assumes that the gov government is politically passive. I'm the government. I'm just, I wait for you guys to organize, and then I engage with you. But that is not necessarily the case in the real world, because governments do have the political capacity to actually manipulate taxpayers. And one of the most common ways in which they do that is by giving exemptions from taxes to some people and not to other people. Um, and that's particularly true of large businesses. So uh, if, I, if we were a low-income country, and I'm the government and you're the taxpayers, but some of you in these two tables here, you provide the great majority of taxes, and you're quite a small number of large companies. You might just number a few dozen. Well, it's does not too difficult for me to uh, realize that um, if I kind of give tax breaks to these three guys here in this table and not to those, that is actually enough, you know, to make sure that you, the private companies don't get collectively together to uh, represent government. Um, that argument is in another reading of mine, more 2015. Uh, point five, which is also relevant, is that this whole argument that I've set up uh, 
is based on the idea that you have a centralized government and that virtually all revenue is collected by one centralized government, uh, which is fairly coherent and stable. But if you have a revenue system in which a lot of different parts of government actually collect taxes, then the possibilities of this kind of bargain is going to be less. Um, just because, uh, you know, taxes. If these guys on this table are pay, paying taxes actually to two distinct different governments in large quantities, say the provincial government and the national government, well then, you know, the whole picture gets more and more complicated. And then the final point on this is, it's again, the, the broad argument starts to, needs to be broken down into a little more detail. And is the broad argument here that the citizen taxpayers are motivated by the level of taxes uh, relative to their income, or is it the level of taxes relative to what they receive in return? In other words, what is it that actually motivates you guys about taxes? Are you going to be more motivated um, if you, uh, I'm just taking a lot of your income, or if I'm taking a lot of your income without apparently giving you anything in return. So if you try and reduce these general ideas to a kind of testable social science proposition and measure it, uh, then you begin to run into a whole lot of questions about um, what exactly is, is going on. And the testability of these ideas is key and it's actually very difficult to test them in terms of social science because the arguments are, there are many different variants of one broad general argument and measuring them is really a problem. So I cannot, you know, say, yep, there is really a lot of evidence that this thing happened. But there is a certain amount of evidence, and in as far as people try and test it, there do seem to be some kind of causal connections between levels of taxes and changes and shifts towards more representative democratic government. So I'm pretty sure there's some truth in this argument. It's not a false argument. There is some truth. Um, but um, we don't know how much is there. And... I think that will all look kind of more plausible after we're going to have a break in a minute to look at the other side of the coin, um, which is the resource curse. Before we do that, are there any specific questions about this side of the coin, the tax side of the coin? Yeah. What happened when taxpayers are, don't know actually that are paying taxes? I mean, by direct taxes or when I go to the market and just buy stuff, actually I don't know what taxes I'm paying. Yep. Yeah. And then because maybe they don't have that kind of accountability or uh, in your case basis or something else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a good point. That's, I mean, the technical term for that often used is the salience of taxes, which means does it actually hit me in the head when I'm paying taxes or not? And the salience varies quite a lot. And which is partly why governments who want to raise a lot of revenue and succeed in raising a lot of revenue do it by setting up a tax system that's quasi-automatic so you don't even realize you're paying taxes. So, you know, most of it, I said, most of the British government depends very heavily on people like me. Um, it depends particularly on personal income tax. But my personal income tax is directed, sorry, is... Uh, diverted, taken away from my salary by my employer, which is IDS, I never see the money. It never gets in my pocket. And then the taxpayer man comes along and says, give. I don't see it. In the same way with value-added tax, it's just one of those things you pay when you go and buy your groceries. You don't see it. Um, so salience does clearly matter because those taxes that people actually have to pay by putting their hand in their pocket and getting money out tend to be the taxes that are more resisted. And property taxes is a classic case. You know, if you have a property tax that's collected every year on your, your land or your house or whatever, in virtually every system, this requires you, you know, at least to set up some kind of direct debit on your bank account to say, you know, pay your local government so much, or you get a bill or whatever. But it's more salient. 
And that is one of the reasons why property taxes are often very unpopular, because people know that they pay them. So, yeah, that's a very important point. But again, salience varies quite a lot. Um, if you were a small business, um, as I said, from the point of view of the consumer, paying value-added tax, this is not salient to me. I don't see it. If you were a small business and you had to, you're, you're um, collecting value-added tax and you're having to pay it, typically you have to keep incredibly detailed records which are really irritating for you. <laughs> so, I mean, value-added tax is very salient for small businesses, not so much because of the amount they have to pay, but the costs involved to them in actually kind of managing this tax. Um, I don't think I meant to say that most taxes are collected by local government officials. What I might have said, which sounds the same, but is actually very different, that most people in low-income countries who pay taxes experience tax collection from local government officials, which is not quite the same thing. Because the point is the amounts they're paying uh, tend to be quite small. So, you know, most tax revenue is collected um, by central government agencies and, as I said, tends to be more from business than from individuals. Um, and it's, but, but local governments, they don't collect a lot of revenue, but that's part of the problem. They collect quite small amounts of revenue from poor people. And the way that tax systems work is, um, okay, let's do a contrast. Uh, when I pay my income tax in Britain, you know, I mean, this is done entirely, if you like, bureaucratically. You know, there is a standard um, amount of money I'm supposed to pay, and the tax office at the university knows what that is, and it's all automated, and then the money all goes to the uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. I never have to do have anything to do with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. And if I try and phone them up, they mostly say, go away. Um, we're not interested. You're paying your personal income tax. <laughs> That's fine. Um, but there is virtually zero opportunity for anyone in Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to come and tap me on the shoulder and say, um, time you paid me something. Whereas, if you talk about local revenue collection, and especially in low-income countries, this, basically you are talking about people paying some kind of property tax or some kind of business tax. You know, you have to pay so much to run a newspaper shop and so much to run a hairdresser. Um, and in, a, in a situation where the economy is only very partially digitalized. So what tax collection in those environments is, is basically someone coming to your hairdressing shop and uh, saying, oh, six months are up, uh, time for you to pay again, you know. Um, and how about a little something for me? And of course, it's personal and it's direct and there's no one checking it and it's not effectively written. I mean, the guy might write something afterwards and say, I collected so much from you. But the possibilities of um, a little bit of abuse by tax collectors are much bigger in those circumstances. And of course, tax collectors can always, um, and this is probably the more common situation, tax collectors say, well, according to the law, you are supposed to pay uh, 20,000 shillings this six months. But look, I'll call it, I'll call it 16,000, um, and that's uh, 2,000 for you and 2,000 for me, pay me 2,000. So, you know, it's collusion <laughs> at the cost, if you want, of, of government. So I think that's, that is the broad difference. Any other? Yeah. So, uh, governments tax businesses, and then businesses respond by shifting the burden of 
Even though they're increasing the basic cost of their products? Not necessarily. Uh, it depends how competitive the market is. Um, I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, why is this potentially allowed? Basically, like for businesses to shift the burden to the consumer, in essence, paying zero taxes. Because then it also sort of creates this negative narrative about taxes in the mind of the common taxpayer. I mean, the argument. You know, this is a complex issue in economics, whether the burden is shifted to businesses' customers. I mean, someone has to pay. If, if business is paying taxes, then someone has to bear the burden of that. Um, whether the idea of shifting, which is the idea of if taxes are increased by so much, then all that increase is paid by uh, the customers. I mean... That is always an argument used against any attempt to increase taxes, but it's not necessarily true. I mean, in a, you know, in a competitive environment, if um, business taxes go up, some businesses will, um, you know, decide to shift this to customers. Other businesses will uh, might not increase and uh, shift the whole thing to customers and gives them a competitive advantage. So, it, you know, it's determined by the market, not by any. Yeah. Yolani. Very virulent about not increasing tobacco taxes, even if like, oh, you know what, uh, we have to increase, uh, you know, the price of tobacco. Uh, you know, our profits are going to get hit. But are we ever actually increase uh, the price of cigarettes to immediately? Like, if they don't shift the entire price of uh, consumers, and even when they do, like. Is used as a, as a constant argument that like companies want to increase taxes. Um, yep. Okay, so 10 minutes break, and then we'll look at the, the resource curse, which is the other side of this whole story. I know we were working on the assumption that everyone is obliged to pay taxes, but wouldn't it be that if the taxpayer doesn't feel that his taxes come back in services and goods from the state, they will also foster like evading taxes if they can? Not yeah. Not only political engagement, but also like, at least what I see in Argentina is, is like people don't feel that they, their taxes come back. In yeah. Area. So So instead of engaging politically, they just work in the black market or... Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually difficult to work out often what's going on because, you know, taxes are universally unpopular, right? Yeah. So yeah. if I ask you to pay taxes, that I'm, in a sense, I'm inviting you to complain about something, yeah. right? And you use... And taxes are always used as an excuse for something. Yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty clear, I think, from research that people are more willing, they say. I mean, the other problem is when you ask people, are you willing to pay taxes? You, n you never know how on the other you get. But it seems that people are willing to pay taxes if they get something in return, if they think that sort of government is broadly legitimate, whatever that means, and if they broadly feel that that kind of government treats citizens fairly well. So if you violate any of those then people are less willing to pay taxes, yeah. it seems. But it is really hard, actually, to because yeah. <laughs> there's so many narratives about this that are going on, which um, you know may or not may or not may or may not be true. Uh, it's very hard. I mean, there's probably a general rule when you're researching on taxes that most people are what people say about taxes is either a lie or heavily based on sort of self-interest. So it's, yeah. it's kind of hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, I mean. It, it, I mean, one of the implications of this is that, um, you know, you might, as a government, you might actually give people more in return. So we're recording all this, aren't we? Um, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, you might actually give, give people more return uh, for their taxes. Yeah. But if they still think government is basically illegitimate or kind of, you know, exploiting people, they might not actually respond by paying any more yeah. taxes. So it's... 
not very predictable. Let me just turn that off for a second. Um, you probably should, yeah, I think. Just Sure. Do whatever you want. <laughs> okay, the resource curse. Um, I'll just start with a mention that Hamza reminded me of something over the break, that historically the first big resource curse um, took place in the 16th century when the government of Spain found enormous amounts of gold in Latin America and um, stole it all and um, was very rich and uh, basically uh, caused itself all kinds of problems. Spain had been the dominant world power and actually collapsed in large part because it had this enormous amount of gold from Spain. But we might come back to that. The resource curse. So that is the idea that having a wealthy resource of a certain kind is actually a problem, is not a blessing. And uh, it's a very common phrase. It is the, as you'll see in a minute, the opposite of, um, well, the other side of the coin from the tax argument. But before we get to it, we, I'm afraid we have to look at a sort of economic concept. I mean, the stuff we're discussing today is the absolute epitome of political economy the interactions between politics and economics. But one of the prices of doing that is sometimes we have to go get a bit of an understanding of a basic economic concept. And this is the concept of an economic rent. And rent is not what you pay to the University of Sussex for your room. It is something, in this case, very different. Um, it's a term that uh, goes back, I don't know, two or three centuries in economics. And let me first say, it is quite difficult to understand, and it's especially difficult to understand if you have never studied economics, because it is based on the fundamental economic idea that in normal circumstances, where you have competitive markets, basically that all um, what you might call profits from economic activity will eventually be competed down to um, a relatively low level. Because if anyone is making big profits from any economic activity, someone else will come into the market and compete with them, and then the profits will go down. And eventually, all that anyone is ever going to get in terms of profits is kind of just enough to uh, make it worth their while to invest more. So, you know, the economy comes down to a sort of, if you like, an equilibrium of low profits for everyone. So this is a fairy tale fantasy. The world is never like that. Um, it's more complicated than that. But just think of that as the kind of baseline normal situation. And that's actually good enough for present purposes. So a rent is the difference between that profit, which I'm going to call normal profit, and what people actually get in particular circumstances. And it's what people get in particular circumstances where they have some kind of political, legal, or organizational power, um, or sometimes pure chance, to give themselves an excess profit. So think of, you can broadly think of rent as a super profit, a windfall profit, or something like that. So here are two examples. Um, you are a prince in one of the Gulf states. We don't have any here, do we? No, OK. Um, so um, you own an oil well. And um, actually, if these figures, funnily enough, for Saudi Arabia are um, not are pretty much close to the truth. It actually costs you $8 a barrel to drill for that, that stuff and actually get it to the point of export. Uh, what's the price of... Um, so anyway, if, imagine that you just wanted a normal profit, say 10%. You would continue drilling and pumping your oil 
when the price got down to you know eight eight point eight dollars because you're still making ten percent profit. Very nice. Actually, you're making much more than that. Uh, I don't know. Oil is probably is it close to a hundred dollars? About hundred dollars a barrel today. Uh, it keeps going up and down somewhere, but. You know, fifty dollars a barrel has been a lowish price for oil in international markets for the last few years. So, if you were selling under normal conditions, you would be getting fifty dollars a barrel, and your rent is the difference between fifty dollars and the eight point eight dollars that you know you basically need to keep you in business. So, this is very good. Um, or not very good, we'll see later. But the first thing to say, if this is very good, and you're a Saudi prince, um, one of the first things going to happen is a lot of people in the world are going to notice that you're making an enormous amount of money from this oil well, and they're going to wonder whether they can actually get control of this oil well from you. So you immediately put yourself in a position of uh, having potentially an awful lot of competition for your oil well. My second example is a much more, if you like, trivial, accidental one. Okay, you're a taxi driver in some um, small town in uh, a big, big country, and you normally charge 50 rupiah a mile for out-of-town trips. And then suddenly there's a big earthquake a few miles away, and very quickly within a day or two, enormous numbers of aid workers and journalists and everything else are all coming into town, and then they all want to go out and see the earthquake and report on it or help with it, etc. And of course, there's a great shortage of taxis because it all happened very quickly. So you now find yourself charging uh, 500 rupiah a mile. And so you're getting, your rent is 450 rupiah. Um, and of course, there is a politics of this because taxi drivers from all over the province would normally rush into town because they want to get some of this business. But um, if the, the taxi drivers of your town can actually uh, get together, say, with the local police and make sure the police have roadblocks into town and find all kinds of reasons why taxi drivers from out of town can't actually come into town, you can carry on make, you know, getting your rents for a couple of weeks or something. Um, but the politics are always there. So that is what rents are. And rents are absolutely central to this argument about the resource case. I think it's important to give a kind of history here of uh, the context to see why and how it's important. So generally speaking, if you go back over the last 200 years, um, and until fairly recently, the major role of the global south in the world economy was providing commodities of various kinds to the north. I mean, that's if you look at the big numbers on international trade, that's what it was, commodities from the south coming to the north. And if we take up about the middle of the last century, these were mostly actually agricultural commodities. Um, the main exception to that, there were significant amounts of tin and copper and other things, mainly coming from Latin America. Um, but dominantly, it was um, agricultural commodities, the cotton, coffee, sugar, tea, and all those kinds of things. Um, and, um, okay, point two is something I've said twice before. I just say it again. There, there were, in some quite a few African states after independence, um, government took advantage of the situation and basically government itself extracted rents from the export of tea, cotton, coffee, sugar, and everything else by taking control and underpaying peasant farmers. So government was doing rent taking there. But the big, really important bit of the, the story begins to change, well, First, it was actually late 19th century, early 20th century, but above all from the 1940s onwards, when the world gradually become very dependent on petroleum, and therefore oil. And the Middle East became a major oil producer and very big in the world economy. And that changed enormously in the 1970s um, when OPEC was founded and... Um, oil prices, there was effectively collaboration between major oil producers and oil prices went up quite a lot. 
the key difference between agricultural commodities and oil is that agricultural commodities are fairly dispersed and widespread. And if you want to get, uh, you know, extract the rents from them, it's a major political operation to do that. Whereas oil is what's called a point resource. It actually comes from a hole in the ground about that big. It's right here. And physically, logistically, it's much more easy to control a point resource because you just basically need to control the territory around it. So the possibility of controlling resources like oil and then gas and then minerals, all things dug from a hole in the ground, is much bigger. And that's a major part of our of the story here. So there are some kind of changes in the natural resource economy. Um, natural gas uh, industry emerges as complement, basically in the same places as oil and as a complement to oil. So it's not very different. Um, you get from, I think, around the 1970s, I can't remember, the technology that you can pump oil and gas offshore. You know, these massive, um, what do you call them? Yeah. Um, so, uh, big expansion in of oil and gas offshore in many places. And you also get, there's also a change that much early mining was very labor intensive. We have lots of people working, and mining increasingly has become the opposite of labor intensive. There's a lot of high technology and a small number of skilled workers, um, but you don't have large labor forces to deal with. And also international transport costs, particularly from the 1960s, uh, very much reduced. So you get a big growth of the natural resource economy. It becomes more and more important in the world economy. The oil, gas, and minerals, they're being pumped and they're being shipped around the world. And more recently, um, in broadly in this century or the end of the last century, economic growth in Asia, especially China, really gives a sort of turbo boost to all this, um, particularly in the period for about eight years from 2004. Massive increase in the prices of almost every commodity in the world. Also, a big increase in the what you might call expansion of the frontier, change in the physical location of the natural resource business. A big shift into sub-Saharan Africa, away from the Middle East, oil, gas, and minerals. has become much bigger in sub-Saharan Africa in the last few decades. Um, and will probably get even bigger because sub-Saharan Africa is still, in geological terms, much less explored than many other parts of the world. So there's probably a lot of hidden stuff. So currently, well, the natural resource economy is a sort of slightly mixed picture. Some natural, important natural resources like copper, iron, bauxite, etc., well, remain very much in demand. Prices, we think, will stay up. Uh, there's a whole set of things called rare earths that are actually central to a whole lot of electronics and electric batteries that become more and more important. And there's a big rush to try and discover them now because a very high proportion are in China, uh, vulnerable. Coal is actually declining um, globally, despite attempts of some governments to promote it. And we hope that oil and gas will be also declining, but um, that's the opposite has been the case over the last year. But we can think that's going to happen in the longer run. So that's the sort of physical context of the different kinds of commodities in the world. This is a very simple attempt to say how important are these commodities in different regions of the world. Now, what is measured here is rents, in the sense that I defined rents earlier. Um, it's not level of production. It's not level of export. It's rents. And the calculation of rents is actually quite a complicated thing. These are rough figures, but they... World Bank has been doing it for quite some years, and they have fairly usable figures that enable you to make reasonable comparisons. So these are, I've taken major regions of the world, regions of the world, 
and looked at rents as a proportion of the, of the gross domestic product of those regions. And I took the period 2010 to 2018, partly because that was a period of relative stability of prices of all these commodities. So you can, you know, it gives you a reasonable representation of uh, you know, the last few decades on average. Um, and the little figures, O is oil, M is mineral, um, D is diamonds. So when it says sub-Saharan Africa, oil, minerals, excludes diamonds. Um, we don't know what diamonds, because diamonds are small and very easily smuggled. Our figures on diamonds are really bad. So what this tells us is that in both the Middle East and North Africa, um, as a collective unit, Rents accounted for an average of around, well, somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of GDP. Now, that is an awfully big figure. Because remember, what rents are is the super profit that people get from producing these things. And they would continue producing these things if the rent is down to virtually zero. And as I said earlier, the fact that the super profit is there is a standing temptation to other people to say, I want to move in and get some of this myself. So, you know, rents are a standing temptation for thuggery, criminality, and all the other things that governments and some other people do. So <laughs> it's quite contentious. So this is big, big money. Uh, for Russia, the Caucasus, is Central Asia. It's also pretty big, not quite so big, 15%. Sub-Saharan Africa, a bit lower, 12%. Latin America and the Caribbean, pretty low, 5%. And South Asia is um, very low. There's a bit of coal, um, a bit of minerals, mostly forestry. Otherwise, we'll, we'll see. So South Asia is pretty much almost a, you know, a natural resource rent-free region uh, in world terms. But again, a little kind of reference to British history. Um, in the 19th century, late 18th, 19th century, Britain was the energy power of the world in the sense that a very high proportion of uh, commercial energy was in the form of coal that was mined in Britain. And Britain happens to be you know, a small island uh, that's very accessible with a lot of rivers. So it was very well placed to mine a lot of coal and then export it and send it in many parts of the world. But Britain did not have a resource case. Um, there was never uh, the kind of issues we're going to talk about now. And the essential reason for that is that the rents in, in coal are always relatively small. You know, digging out coal is really hard work. The costs tend to be relatively high. You can't make that much money from it. And also, at this point, Britain was dominated politically by landowners, and they made it, you know, so this was their coal. It was not government coal. They were powerful enough to keep government hands completely off of this. So they did quite well in terms of rents, but they kept, the, you know, government was pretty much kept out of it. So in those particular circumstances, you could be a big energy exporter, but you don't get caught in the resource case. This is just another simple table. I'm here looking not at regions, but at countries by income categories. And the key point on all this is that rents are higher as a proportion of GDP in lower income countries. And they just decrease as uh, you go up the income scale, and that's quite consistent. Um, and you'll see it's actually you know, forest rents. Rents from forestry are big only in low-income countries. They do not feature anywhere else. So that's partly why we do this issue here, because the whole issue of rents and what happens to them is an issue for lower middle-income countries. I'm just looking here at the economic effects of having an oil well or a large mine or whatever. These are not what I, this is not what I want to talk about principally, but it's just as a kind of background. So arguably, there are two bad economic effects from suddenly discovering you have a lot of oil. Of course, some good effects. You have a lot of money from the oil. 
Um, but there are also some corresponding bad effects. And one of them is to do with, it's often been labeled the Dutch disease because it was first um, seemed to affect Holland in Britain in the 1950s when it was a small oil producer. Um, I'm not going to go into the economics in detail, but effectively what happens if you have an economy that suddenly discovers a lot of oil and starts exporting it and selling it is that your the value of your national currency appreciates. Um, and that means that it is actually cheaper, to, relatively cheaper to import. But it also means that your pre-existing industries that were exporting effectively are earning less export revenues than before. So in other words, discovering one resource like that has tends to have a negative effect on other economic activities in the country, especially exporting activities. So it has a problem. Uh, not, a, you know, not necessarily a totally disastrous problem, but it has an effect. The other general effect of finding a rent goes back to the point I said earlier. You know, rents are very attractive because you can take a rent away from an economic activity um, and you will not stop people doing it. So, you know, if you, metaphorically, if your Saudi prince has an oil well and is making, you know, what was it, 40, something more than $40 a barrel of rents, if someone can kind of hold a gun to his head and say, I'm watching you while you're transferring all your profits to my Swiss bank account, um, you know, they, you can do that for a long time. And he might still be quite willing to do that, or not willing, <laughs> go ahead and doing it, because he's still actually making some profit. You're not taking all his money away, he's still making a reasonable profit. But what we're really interested here is the political effects of having oil, oil gas, and mineral, and particularly point oil, gas, and mineral. So, so like, these things are very controllable. This argument does not apply to agricultural commodities, and it does not apply to what we call artisanal mining. So if in, say, Ghana, you have enormous numbers of people in some places, you know, basically digging down in the ground, looking for little bits of gold, very widespread, a lot of people involved, but no one can very easily come in and get control of this business. So it doesn't apply to artisanal mining. We're talking about point resources. Now, what I'm going to do is, rather than give you a lot of citations of research down on the political effects, the resource curse, I'm going to try and summarize it in a, um, I think, hope accessible way. But let me tell you, massive amount of research has been done on this subject. Really, since the phenomenon, the idea of the resource curse started, I think, in the 1960s, in response to what was happening in the Middle East, people started writing about this. And so much more research is done. And the argument has been examined and turned upside down by social scientists, economists, political scientists, and others. And it's been very thoroughly, very thoroughly examined. And I have no doubt whatsoever that it is true. When I say it's true, I don't mean it's absolutely inevitable, but I mean, on, we'll come back to that, that on average, if in the last 50 years uh, a country started to pump a lot of oil and gas and other things, there are some really bad political consequences tend to happen in most cases. So it's been very big and possibly one of the biggest problems um, direct, immediate pro ways of undermining good government in many parts of the world, especially the low-income parts of the world. So um, let's think about it in terms of a real, uh, okay, a mythical case. Um, Alia, where's Alia? Alia, okay. Um, Alia, okay, so you're president of our country, Alia. Everybody knows Alia, right? She is the most democratically minded person you can possibly imagine. And she really believes in democracy and constitutionality and everything else. And she has been a great prime minister for the last three or four years. So what's your, give me a mythical name for your country. 
imagine name. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, suddenly um, an oil company is representative uh, asks for a meeting with you, Alex, and they say, ma'am, we've got really interesting news. We've been doing a geological survey of your country. Do you know you have a massive amount of oil and gas? Wow. Terrific. And you know, keep it quiet. Um, because, you know, we're going to proceed to uh, try and extract this. Now, if you're a sensible person, the first thing you do is announce this, because, and you get other oil companies to come and compete. But let's imagine you don't. It doesn't matter whether you do or not. But you say, oh, great oil company. Okay, well, I'll give you the rights to go ahead and start extracting. So you say, well, in about four years' time, we're going to be start, start pumping oil, and you're going to get mega money on this. Um, and you think, oh, that's terrific. So you have a meeting of your, your, your cabinet of ministers, and you say, oh, I've got terrific news for you. And we've got oil, and we're going to, we can do so many things. We can make our country, you know, we can abolish poverty in our country, and we can, you know, make our country really wealthy. We can invest in new technologies. It's just great. Um, that's terrific. And then one of your advisors says, oh, yes, ma'am, when is this all going to start? He says, Four years' time. Um, oh, but elections are due in two years, ma'am. Well, it's okay, no problem. Um, are you sure? There's no problem. But supposing they, the opposition, win the elections, do you really think that once they've won the elections and they've come into power and they control all this oil, do you really think they're going to allow another election in seven or eight years' time so that you can come back in power? No way. You know, if you let them in, they're going to keep power because they're going to be really rich, and etc. But of course, Alia being a great Democrat says, "But you know, I believe in democracy. We just have to. You know, things have to go as they are." Well, you know, your leading supporters and your party start talking about this, and next time you have a cabinet meeting a month later, you suddenly find almost everyone else is sitting around the table and say, "Ma'am, we really have to discuss this." Okay. Look, I think you're being really, frankly, madam, I'm sorry, you're being quite naive about what's going on here. You know, we cannot allow those people to come into power. Um, they've already got wind of what's going on. You know, it's news is leaked. And I, you know, I've just been, you know, in, in the bars and everything. I should just hear the way they're talking about if they win the next election, how great life is going to be. We have to do something. And we can't really have an election. Or at least if we have an election, we have to make sure we win it. Um, so how do we do that? Well, you can think of various ways to do that. First thing is, that, well, actually, you know, we could start announcing a direct cash transfer system scheme for the poorest 50% of the population in the country. We'll give them each $1,000 a month. Um, and if we do that, I'm sure we'll win the election. So, yeah, but how are we going to pay for that? We don't have any oil money. Oh, don't worry. Once the world knows we have oil money, there's no shortage of people out there who will lend us money to do this. So um, one scenario here is that then uh, you introduce this cash transfer scheme. I mean, you do other good things. You build a nice new stadium all on the basis of borrowed money. And uh, hey, presto, the election comes along, and you win. Terrific. Well done, man. Excellent. Um, and then, you know, let's move on about four years. The oil starts to uh, appear, and uh, you're still in power. And you're sort of not quite as popular as you were before, because some people are beginning to feel there's an awful lot of money around here, and why don't I have more of it? Um, and then you have a cabinet meeting, and someone says, um, Ma'am, I've, if your defense minister says, I've got a lot of not very good news from the army. There seems to be a lot of unrest in the army, and the army are saying, look, we have oil. Um, our big bully neighbors are eyeing it. They're likely to invade. Um, but, you know, you've done nothing for us. We've, our military salaries are still low. We're under-equipped. Um, no generals go for sort of nice training courses um, 
going to in nice parts of the world, etc. I'm really worried that there's talk of a possible military coup. So you say, okay, uh, we better do something about that. So suddenly military expenditure gets bumped up, and the military get all their new expensive toys, and there's big salary increases, and it goes swanning around the world, and all that kind of thing. And um, that's okay. And but then you know, the next cabinet meeting, someone says, you know, there's just a lot of talk in the streets about some kind of revolution or insurrection or something, not even a military coup. What are we going to do about it? And uh, then your Minister of Security comes and says, you know, I think we need a really good political intelligence network to find out what's actually happening on the streets. Um, I need money. Uh, I need about $50 billion, actually, to set up a good political intelligence network just to keep an eye on what's happening. Um, and I'm going to employ the equivalent of 3% of the population as my agents just to report on what's coming, just for our security, ma'am, just for our security, nothing else. Um, okay, so um, then we, uh, we have this big you know, apparatus for doing that. But still, you're not very popular, you know, because there's a lot of money around. There's still a lot of people who think, well, I'm not actually getting any of this. And um, you know, elections are again looming, and your security apparatus say, you know, everything we're picking up suggests that actually you're going to lose the next elections. Um, this is really, you know, what, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but people are just stupidly unhappy. Um, you're going to lose the next elections. They're just irrational. They're not even. They don't understand their own interests. What are we going to do about that? So um, some of your smart advisors say, well, you know, the problem is that the opposition is fairly united and they have some really good people there. So I'm sure, you know, we, I'm sure we could do something about that. So um, some of your people go to the three leading figures in the opposition, the most prominent people, and um, say, um, here's a number of a Swiss bank account, um, you know, there's $10 million in there now, and there's more later. Um, but I want you just to report back to me everything that happens in your party. And so they start reporting back everything that happens. And then you see the possibility, oh, the party's a bit divided about this. You say, well, if you guys can actually organize a nice split in the opposition party over this, there's another $10 million in your Swiss bank account. Um, and you do that, and there's a bit of there's a split, and then you fund two of these girls to set up their own separate opposition parties that are apparently publicly vehemently opposed to you, you know, absolutely ve vehemently opposed. But when election comes, they all stand in exactly the seats that you want them to stand in in order to deny votes for the opposition. So you win the election to begin with. Okay, so. I mean, I could kind of go on and give more detail, but that is a summary <laughs> of what I think the politics of oil are. Um, it's a lot of money, and there's always the worry that someone else is going to move in. It's the opposition, um, or it's a neighboring government, or it might be, and I mean, this has happened, especially in Africa in the past. Um, the government of France uh, supports a French oil company Used to be called ELF, to, who actually then you know support a coup. I mean, this is not this is not fantasy. It's actually happened. I'm not saying it will happen in all circumstances. So what we find, if you discover oil, you or gas in significant quantities with significant amounts of rent attached, and the rent is really important, um, you get a deterioration or no improvement in measures of democracy and accountability, um, transparency, etc., because you really don't want people to know where, how you're actually spending your oil money. Uh, no one wants to know that $50 billion are being spent on political intelligence, etc. Um, and essentially, when it, if you have lots and lots of money, you're able to pay your um, direct cash transfer scheme to half the population for $1,000 a month, and you can do these other things. But if you don't have enough money, 
you tend to do the other things and not pay the cash transfers. Because the other things, you know, the keeping the military happy, dividing the opposition, uh, you know, paying off all prominent oppositions, having a good political intelligence apparatus, they keep you in power fairly reliably. You know, a direct cash transfer scheme might be good, but you find you can fix the elections anyway, so you're not that worried about the cash transfer scheme. So some countries which have had great, you know, natural resource wealth, wealth have done really badly on human development indicators, health, education, mortality, etc., and completely controversially done very badly. But that depends on context. I mean, if you have as much oil as Saudi Arabia, you can keep most of the indigenous population in idleness as well as um, you know, funding all these other things. So uh, you don't. That's not a choice there. But those regimes that benefit actually tend to last a long time. And they last a long time for the reasons we just gave, because they have enough money uh, as far as possible to insulate themselves. And of course, they do other things with this. They, they buy support internationally. Um, and there was a time, it's now fast disappearing, but there was a time when... Uh, you probably know France maintained a much more direct neo-colonial relationship with its West African colonies than Britain did, for example. And um, a number of those colonies were resource rich. And we know uh, that um, in some cases, the leaders of those African colonies were even funding French political parties. They were using their natural resource wealth from there to go and fund political parties in France so that you know, they would be supportive. And then in return, the French government used to uh, post uh, units of the French army in strategic places, etc. So all, all the kind of worst of the uh, international influence was actually there. So um, pretty close to the end, but what I want to do is just talk a little bit about the importance of how do we know this stuff. It all sounds very convincing, but how do we know? Um, there is a difference between the, the tax issue I discussed in the first half, where I say, I think the evidence suggests that there is some truth in the basic story, but I can't prove it. In this case, I have no doubt that the evidence is very convincing. Um, but it just the ex the extent to which natural resources have these bad effects varies a great deal from case to case, and we can't say very reliably um, what they are. And I'll just look at some of the, the the research problems of actually working out what's going on. Well, all this debate started in the Middle East, as I say. People saw a few Middle Eastern, mostly kingdoms or similar, getting oil rich, and they started writing particular stories about what they, they called the rentier state, which means a state that lives on rents. But um, social scientists weren't happy about that. And they said, well, you know, you can't learn anything. You can get insight from individual stories. But we need to know across the board the size of natural uh, resource industry. Does that consistently correlate with kind of you know, political outcomes? And so we have a massive amount of statistical work based on a large number of samples from different countries on different dimensions of this argument. And there are hundreds of these resources. Uh, of, sorry, of these studies. Some of the questions, here's just a few of the questions you need to look at. Resources cause a problem. Well, it depends which resources. The problems are these point natural resources. The things come from a hole in the ground, because those are the things that are controllable. So, I mean, I've seen people saying, well, I've measured all natural resources in the world, and there's no correlation between having natural resources and having good or bad uh, governance. Yeah, but the answer is, but you've included all forestry and agricultural resources. We know they're not the problem. It's the point natural resources. Another problem is that it's quite difficult to measure rents. I say the, the World Bank now does have a reasonably good series, country by country, year by year. But many of the early bits of research, when people measured the 
the natural resource economy. They didn't use rents because they didn't have the figures. So they used figures like you know, the total output or the total output relative to GDP or natural resource exports relative to GDP or some other inadequate measure of the thing. So it's no surprise that you get some results that don't look, uh, you don't get the result you would expect because you're really doing the analysis very weakly. And then there's all kinds of other problems like you know, foreign involvement. Well, we don't know what the foreign involvement is very often because much of this is conducted in a kind of secretive kind of way. Um, when we look at the effect of natural resources on governance, should we be looking at how much rent was extracted this year and last year? Is that what matters? Or is it the total amount that people think is in the ground to be pumped in the future? We don't know. So there are a lot of problems with doing research on this. And so any conclusion is basically what I call probabilistic. You know, there's a high probability if you get significant natural resource rents, you're going to have political problems. Um, but exactly what those problems are and how big, um, we can't say. Now, I think it's the final slide. Yeah, that's OK. I'm just going to very briefly say that a lot of effort has gone into finding solutions for the resource curse. And all those solutions uh, essentially involve trying to distribute the power and influence over natural resources more widely. Because to some extent, the problem here is governments in collusion with private companies or sometimes state-owned companies benefiting enormously from this. And um, one of the common problems is um, the one I mentioned earlier, just earlier in terms of when we first discovered oil in our country. The geological survey was done by a private oil company and they go straight to the government and say, we've got the oil man, can we now go ahead and start you know, exploiting it? Well, the first... If you had a better system, the first thing you do is say, geological surveys are not private property, they are public property, and all geological surveys should be available to everyone. So that some other oil company can come along and say, oh, I see we've got some potential oil resources here, and make a better bid and a more transparent bid than the, the company that actually did the geological survey. So transparency about information, then transparency about contracts. If you're going to give a contract to uh, pump gas from this particular part of the coast, um, then you, want, you should ideally have an open auction on this, and the, the auction should go to the, uh, the highest bidder, um, rather than this being done surreptitiously with money paid into Swiss bank accounts, etc. Uh, the third... Um, proposal that's often used is that governments shouldn't simply take all the revenue each year into their budget and spend it, but they should put a large part of it away in some kind of special fund that would be used for long-term development purposes or for you know, some kind of strategic purposes. You shouldn't confuse oil revenue with current earnings, um, which is very sensible, and some governments do that. Another argument is that um, governments should not keep these rents from natural resources at all. They don't belong to government, they belong to citizens. So they should simply be, all the revenue that government gets from natural resources should just be divided among all adult citizens. Um, it's actually quite a very appealing argument. Um, I think I would probably support it in many cases because the problem is that natural resources are just giving government too much power. I mean, that's the, kind of the nub of it. Or another milder version of that is that you should uh, distribute all those um, the tax revenue you get from natural resources among different levels of government. So it's not just central government that gets it all, but provincial government, local government, etc. So there's no shortage of very good ideas, all of which look great in theory, and they all come across one major obstacle, which is that central governments are not going to willingly give up all this money. <laughs> so there has not been a great deal of progress on, uh, on any of these things. So that's the resource curse. Um, 
questions, comments? Sorry, if the government allowed. And they couldn't do that, but for the last time it's been sanctioned. Yeah. It's for 80 and for 100 years or 200 years. It's really hard, but it's a guarantee. And I like to see, like, for example, what the government can do in order to, like, um, kind of, you know, ease in, in the power or just get the intention that we should, instead of just gambling for, like, the company. Like, um, ideally. I mean, that is another way of doing it, is that basically the government says, we own this resource, and we are just going to give a contract to companies to extract the resource. It's called a concession in French. Um, and it's again, it's probably a very good idea. Um, because one of the issues about natural resources is that you rarely know actually how much you have. Because the geological exploration exploration is incomplete. You haven't actually started digging holes. And when you dig holes, you, just, you get much more information. But also, you don't know now, uh, you know, you might have a, you have be in the Congo, um, you typically copper and coltan are found together. You get them from the same hole in the ground. Um, we don't know now whether in, you know, in 20 years time, what's going to be the relative price of copper and coltan, for example. So in principle, it makes a lot of sense for governments to maintain control, give the management uh, you know, agreement out for a relatively limited period of time. I don't know quite what that would be. Um, but those arrangements are very rare. Um, and I don't know exactly why they're rare, but I suspect that part of the reason is that, you know, at least certainly in mining, I mean, mining is glo dominated globally by quite a small number of very big companies um, based in, well, Canada, uh, Switzerland, Australia, quite, you know, and they, I suspect that they probably just say, no, we're not going to do this, but I don't know. But it, 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 it is a very, you know, possibly one of the more interesting um, ways of making progress on this. No, to, just to comment regarding the, the last point, that within the, within federal countries, for, for the, the, the case of Argentina, that yeah. actually the natural resources belong to the provinces, not right. to the central government. Yep. And you have the same issue, but at national level. Right. So in, in terms of the distribution, it's it's harder to actually that the province give to other province that from the central government that there should be a, some kind of distribution. So sometimes the decentralization of these natural resources is maybe worse than having it in the central government and so with some kind of... Yep, yeah. And actually, it, it, Argentina is interesting in this case, and you may know this, but one of the earlier good bits of research on this took was done by a guy called... Gervasoni, who's, I don't know him, okay, who's Argentinian. And he took advantage of the fact that Argentina is unusual in that it actually gave authority to provincial government. But that meant that you could actually compare the evolution of governments in different provinces according to whether they had oil or they didn't have oil. And he, his conclusion was that those that had oil had um, become less democratic and generally, well, it was a good bit of resource curse argument. But there are very few other countries that actually, in fact, I don't, I may be wrong, I don't know of another country in the world that actually gives authority um, to, and that I suspect also that's partly because the oil industry in Argentina is quite small overall. I, I suspect if it were actually bigger, central government would have taken it over before now. And also, we don't have the technology at the moment to explore and discover uh, new uh, projects. So, can the government stop this exploration? And how this can affect the development? I mean, 
you know, if, if I represent the interests of the world in the long term, I would no doubt say, yes, they should stop right now, which is, I think, what your, um, what your president kind of is saying. But um, you probably know your finance minister is also a governor of IDS, and um, he, has a, he has a very different view of, of this. I mean, I think, again, it's like some of these solutions. I cannot actually, at the moment, imagine any government that has a lot of natural resources saying, no, we're going to keep them in the ground. And especially things like oil and gas that we believe and we hope are actually going to be much less valued in 10 or 20 years' time because we're going to transition away from them. I just can't imagine it happening because I would have thought the popular pressure to say, no, you know, everyone else is getting money from these. Why should we make the sacrifice? I think they're too big. I mean, it could happen in particular cases where you have an industry, and this might be the mining industry, that's also causing a lot of other problems of, say, water pollution. Um, you know, you might get particular industries closed down on a fairly small scale, but I don't, I don't see <laughs> you know, any government behaving so um, self, um, what's the word, yeah, yeah, in the, in the collective interest rather than the interest of their country. But, you know, I hope I'm wrong about Colombia. <laughs> Falls or problems for that solution, I see in it maybe, that they will not provide like a, a collective holistic uh, solution to the resource cost. Like, for example, the Middle East, like the United Arab Emirates, or whatever, they pay rent money to, to citizens, they provide very rich, high level of, uh, um, of life in, in, in you know, the Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia. So they keep their, their system going. Uh, so, and instead of uh, in return, there is no freedom, there is no social freedom. Uh, but for example, in Bahrain, they are not giving people who are freedom, but they are not giving popular money to people from Shia. Um, <laughs> right. And they are yep. moving them into the yep. Yep. And also, like they are, um, they are buying uh, countries and journalists and actors and actresses from Absolutely. the Arab world. So, and also we have uh, developed uh, like uh, this called what we call public investment funds. Their, their, their fund is the second largest one after China and Indonesia. Exactly. Yep. So they might give money, but uh, they, they will keep in power. So uh, I'm not sure, like, I think maybe the solution would be a revolution, but it's also uh, when you see people from Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, like, we are happy about getting money. So enough. They, yep. they can live as a political regime. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's very hard. To see in this case where you have a lot of money like that and you can pay off your citizens, it's very hard to see how you can change the system because you have you know, stable governments, as you say, they know how to play the game in the world. They have they are buying friends and allies and publicity all over the world. Um, but you know the only positive side of this is to say that uh, you know the end of the oil and gas economy is not only very good for the world environment, it's actually going to be quite good for governance in many parts of the world. So, you know, the sooner it comes, the better. <laughs> okay, one more, then. Yeah. I mean, the, I think the negative political outcomes are very well established now. Um, I mean, they might, we don't know, the, we can't predict in detail what the negative political outcome will be. I think they're well established. The economic outcome is a bit more open because on the one hand, you know, having this export industry makes it immediately difficult for, com uh, for other industries to grow up. But at the same time, you have this very large economic surplus that you're getting from oil and gas that you could be investing in other industries. Now, you know, as you probably know, the um, somewhat unpopular MBS, um, the Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin... Yeah, 
Um, I mean, that in a sense is his strategy. He's saying, you know, we have a lot of money that we can invest in transitioning away, take Saudi Arabia away from the oil economy, and that in 20 years' time, when oil has disappeared, we will have, you know, built enough. So there is always that possibility. I mean, if you use the surplus from the oil or gas in that way, but the fact is that the great majority of surpluses from oil and gas and minerals have actually been used on militaries, on corruption, <laughs> consumption, and very few have actually been invested in any, you know, any major way. I mean, it's actually quite a tragic story. Um, and it, it's quite paralleled by, as I said earlier, um, thanks to Hamza, the first resource curse case was Spain in the 16th century. Spain was a world power, the world, the biggest world power. Got all that gold. Um, and this really kind of, uh, I mean, it's much been written about. I won't go into detail. But, I mean, this is clearly a significant cause of the collapse of Spain as a great power and a great civilization was a far too much money very quickly. OK, remember, not far too much money very quickly. It, too much money very quickly is a kind of curse of the world in many, many dimensions, not even this one. I mean, not, not only this one. Oh. <laughs>